Hey guys, Mr. Fitch here. Um, we are going to go through the entire World War I experience in one PowerPoint. I have done something amazing here. I have taken three PowerPoints, over a hundred slides, and I have kind of compressed them and um, summarized them into one PowerPoint that's only about 40 slides or so. So, I mean, I've cut this baby almost down less than half. So I'm going to do everything I can to keep this um, as simple as I can, but also as detailed as I can. Again, you can pause this at any time you want, okay? Be, I'm not going to stop. Um, all right, seventh grade, let's get started. World War I wasn't called World War I yet. Surprised, right? It was uh, only called the Great War. World War II hadn't happened yet, so... Um, you can't have World War One until you've had World War Two, and hopefully we do not have World War Three. And it was nicknamed the War to End All Wars because for this time, it was so brutal and so terrible. No war had ever been fought like it before across the whole planet, but mostly Europe, Africa, and the Middle East, where just millions of people died. It was crazy. And um, we are going to address these six questions in this summarized PowerPoint. So Germany um, was not a country, actually. Um, before 1870, Germany was made up of several small states and kingdoms and provinces. It had pretty much been that way since the end of the Holy Roman Empire. So about 500 years, Germany had just not existed as a country. It had been literally centuries. And in 1870s, the uh, Germans, led by Otto Bismarck, he, he kind of basically creates the German Empire. And within about 20 years, Germany goes from being just a bunch of little kingdoms to being a very large empire and the most powerful country on the entire continent of Europe. I say on the continent because England was more powerful, but England's not on the continent. And just like England and France and America and all the other powers of Europe, Germany wanted to expand its power and its influence, okay? They wanted to take the fatherland, as they call it, and they wanted to expand the borders of Germany. The question was just when. So, you know, imagine America not being America, but each of the 50 states being their own small country. And then imagine it being like that for centuries, and then suddenly America becoming reunited. That would cause ripples that were going to reverberate around the entire world. And the same would be true of Germany, okay? Um, Germany wanted war. In fact, Germany drew up its war plans about a decade before the, uh, the war actually happened. There's a plan called the Schlieffen Plan. He basically borrowed from Hannibal, and he basically took Hannibal's tactics, a man named Schlieffen, and he, he basically adopted Hannibal's attack on Rome um, at the Battle of Kenny, and he wanted to do basically the same thing to France. And then after they had conquered France, Germany would conquer or at least push back against Russia. So this was the plan for Germany's European expansion. Um, thank God it did not work. But the fact that they had um, this battle plan a decade in advance tells you their mindset, their mentality. They wanted war. So did most of the other powers. Uh, Europe at this time in particular was very empire hungry. They wanted colonies. They all wanted to be like what England was. England was, you know, the size of Pennsylvania or a little bit bigger than Arizona. But yet it had an empire that expanded on the entire globe. Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, Egypt, um, parts, other parts of Africa on the east coast, north coast. South Coast, West Coast, Europe uh, could not keep up with them in terms of that. They controlled parts of China, India, obviously, um, Hong Kong, Canada, and obviously at one time, America as well. England's empire was everywhere, and the other countries wanted to do likewise. So basically, Africa is going to get carved up. But the main point is, is that Europe was itching for a war. It was the age of empire building, and they all wanted power. The only thing they were waiting for is just that spark. What would be the spark that would set off war? 
And you know the answer to this. We have talked about it in in a agnosium. I'm not going to spend a whole bunch of time talking about it. But you know that Archduke Ferdinand was assassinated with his wife in Sarajevo by the Black Hand by Prince Up in 1914 out in front of the deli. And this is one of the causes for the war, okay? Expansion. The other cause for World War One was empire expansion, empire building, okay? But now the second cause is assassination. That's the other big reason um, that we had World War I, the assassination of Archduke Ferdinand. So the video that you watched the other day talked about it a little bit, The uh, um, where Ferdinand would have kept uh, Austria out of war with Russia no matter what. That's important. I'm going to explain why. Why his death was the trigger point, was the domino that started the war, okay? And it all boils down to very simple things. Um, men with power want more power. Countries with land want more land. It's pretty simple. Um, and you have Austria-Hungary, and you have the, of, um, the uh, Serbs, the country of Serbia, which is populated by a group of people called the Slavs. So the word I'm going to use the word Serbs and Slavs interchangeably here. Um, they wanted control of a piece of land called Bosnia. Well, Austria-Hungary wanted Bosnia. And the Black Hand wanted um, to have Bosnia under the control of Serbia. Okay? So you have two groups fighting for the same piece of land. One group has a terrorist organization who murders the leader of the other group, Austria-Hungary. And you can see Prince Epp right here being arrested after the assassination. Here's a, here's a photo of the police arresting him at that time. And here's what he looked like in his mugshot photo, if you will. Okay? So what does this look like on a map? So you can see Austria-Hungary here. You can see Serbia here and the Slavs. And they are basically going to um, fight for this piece of land. And you can see here's Italy. Um, Greece is below. If you, if I could um, move my mouse further down, you would see that Greece is, uh, is underneath us, um, but it's just not on the screen. But they're fighting for that piece of land right there. Um, Austria-Hungary wants it. Serbia wants it. And there's reasons for it that are not worth going into while you're in seventh grade. You can worry about that when you're in college, if you even worry about it at all. Um, but this whole area, collectively, is called the Balkans, okay? All of this area is called the Balkans, or um, Eastern Europe, Southern Eastern Europe. And the problem is, is that Russia wants it, okay? Russia doesn't just want, Russia could care less about these two countries fighting over this little piece of land here. Russia wants the whole freaking thing. And the reason why Russia wants everything, very simply, they, they, have, they have territorial aspirations too. Russia wants more land, more power, more influence. Particularly, they want access to the Mediterranean Sea. Because once they have access to the Mediterranean Sea, they can buy and sell and do their trading and make millions and billions of dollars because the Mediterranean Sea connects to Europe, to Africa. It's the You can go through the Suez Canal and head out to um, the Asia, or you can go across the ocean uh, through to the Atlantic, across the ocean to to America. Um, the point is, if you can get to the Mediterranean Sea, you have pretty much water access to the rest of the world. Remember, um, planes have just been invented. Okay, planes have only been around for about 15, 20 years. Um, well, 1908, I think, right? 1901, 1901. Um, anyways, it's been about a decade, and airplanes have just started taking off, literally, and, you know, metaphorically speaking. So air travel is still very brand new. The idea of selling your goods using airplanes was still a very novel idea. Very, very, um, people were still going to use ships in the early 1900s, okay? So that's the main point here. So this area is all the Balkans, and they want everything. Now, Serbia is allies with the Russians, so, um... Austria, they want to destroy the Slavs. They have no love for them whatsoever. They are a mongrel race. They deserve to die as far as Austria-Hungary is concerned. They just need a reason. 
and the assassination of the Archduke gave them that reason to attack them and to kill them. Um, now remember, they hate the Archduke. You may remember the Archduke's funeral lasted just about 15 minutes, okay? These people hated the Archduke. So it's not that they were, do it's not that they were trying to get revenge because they love their dead king. They are just looking for any excuse to attack Serbia and to get control of Bosnia, all right? And like I said, um, the Russians are related to the Slavs. They're, they're like uh, ethnically in the same family tree. So the Russians view themselves as kind of the protectors of the Slavs. So the Austria, Austria knows if they attack Serbia, if they attack the Slavs, that Russia is going to come to their aid. So this is why the Archduke wanted to avoid war at any cost. Okay, because he knows if they go to a war, excuse me, the Archduke knew if they went to war, this was going to not only just destroy um, his country and his empire, but probably the entire countryside of the Balkans themselves um, if Russia went to war with the Eastern European countries. So that's what the Archduke wanted to avoid at all costs. Sadly, he died, and so the war came. Um, so the third reason we have World War I is this web of alliances. This is crazy convoluted, but it kind of makes sense. Um, if you get into a fight and somebody is stronger than you, you want help, okay? And Serbia is a little power. Austria-Hungary is a medium power. It's not a big, but they're certainly bigger than Serbia. So, as we've said, Serbia and Russia, they're ethnically kind of in the same race, so... Serbia says, Russia, come help us, please, please. We can't beat Austria-Hungary without you. And again, their relationship would be very similar to America and England. Um, America and, Eng and the English, Americans and the English share a lot of culture, heritage, language. So if they ever needed help, England comes to our aid and we come to England's aid um, and vice versa and all that good stuff. So Serbia is going to help um, excuse me, Serbia is going to get the help of Russia. Well, Austria-Hungary has allies too. And Austria-Hungary's big, strong, powerful ally is Germany, a reunified Germany. Remember, Germany wants a war. They're, they're looking for any excuse they can get to go to war. Well, these two little powers, Austria-Hungary and Serbia, are fighting over things. Germany could give a flying crap what they're fighting about. They don't care what they're fighting about. What they're doing is they're looking for a reason to start a war, to expand their empire, expand their territory, to become a global power. So they, Germany right now in you know 1914 sees this as an opportunity to use the conflict between Serbia and Austria to basically start a war in Europe, to activate the Schlieffelin plan. So these two little powers and medium powers get help from the big powers. Well, Russia is not alone. Russia has other allies too, particularly France and Britain. And so they get help from them. Well, Germany has allies as well. <laughs> Germany has the Ottoman Empire, which is basically the old Ottoman Empire that conquered the Byzantine Empire. Ottoman Empire had been around for nearly 600 years at this point. It's not as, it used to be a mighty power, but now it's very, very weak and very, very sick. Um, the Ottoman, after the end of World War I, the Ottoman Empire will completely fall apart and we'll get all the wonderful countries that you know about today. Iran, Iraq, Turkey, Israel, Palestine. Uh, all of those Middle East countries that we have today are going to be the broken fragments of the Ottoman Empire. Um, and Italy uh, is going to play both sides of the war, in case you're wondering. So this is what it looks like. You have basically the little powers are going to drag all the big powers into conflict. It is just this twisted web of alliances. It's pretty insane. But basically, you're going to have the Russians on one side, England and France on the other side, very similar to World War II, um, versus the middle powers here, Austria, Hungary, the Middle East, and... Um, Germany are all going to kind of unite. Italy's going to play both sides. They're going to be on one side of the war for a while, and then when the uh, German side starts losing, they're going to flip, and they're going to go to the French side and the Allies side, and America's going to come in too. But you can kind of see, and then the yellow countries here are, are neutral. So. 
So again, um, the alliance again very similar to World War II. Not that not all that different. Um, you're going to have the Triple Alliance, and by Triple Alliance, again, we're not, I'm not talking about the little powers. Um, the the conflict between the Serbs and the Hungarians for control of Bosnia that ceased to be important about five minutes after the war started. Okay, that was just an afterthought by that point. That was just the excuse people used to get their foot in the door. And so you're going to have the, the alliance, the triple alliance, the Ante powers. Thank you, French, for using big words. England, France, and Russia. Russia is only going to be in the war until the final year. America is going to enter, basically fill that spot. And like I said, Italy will play both sides. Okay, So here are the flags um, of the different countries. But you know, very similar to World War II. Um, just substitute Japan for uh, the Ottoman Empire, more or less. And America is going to come in and kick butt at the very end. You'll see. Um, the battles. Oh my gosh. The battle lines were nothing like World War II. There were no crazy amounts of tanks and panzers and planes. Most of World War II, excuse me, most of World War I was spent in the trenches. It was known as trench warfare. People basically dug ditches, and if you poked your head up for too long, you would basically get shot. Okay? It was pretty terrible. You basically spent three years of your life wasted away in a hole in the ground. Yeah, it was pretty terrible, okay? Every now and then you would get up and invade and try to attack the enemy. And if you took the enemy's trench, the enemy retreated, well, the enemy had built another trench about a mile behind them. So if the enemy lost the trench they were in, all they did was retreat one mile to a new trench. And if the allies lost their trench, well, they had dug a backup trench another mile down the road. So even if you took one trench from your enemy, you still had a trench behind that and another trench behind that. So it really didn't make a difference. You literally would have thousands of people die just to try and take a hole in the ground. It was insane. And so one of the solutions that people came up with, well, instead of sending humans in there with guns to get shot, what if we just uh, sent, um, we launched gas grenades over, okay? And we use poison gas. And so World War I was the first war where they started using poison gases or tear gas at the very least. Um, and so gas masks started to get worn by everyone, including horses, actually. But the problem with gas is if the wind changes direction, and if you've launched a poison gas at your enemy, but you know the wind's blowing from the east, and suddenly the wind changes directions and starts blowing to the west, that gas is gonna come right back and kill you. So people had to start taking gas masks with them. It's pretty crazy, right? Um, the area in between the trenches, between where the Germans were and the French and the British, that was called no man's land, okay? Very apt because if, you tr if any man tried to cross that area, they would get shot and killed by snipers. Pretty simple. Um, it would literally, you'd have to be a superhero to cross, okay? Um, obviously, a lot of you have probably seen this very famous scene in Wonder Woman where she crosses the, the no man's land because she's not a man. Um, no, it's, it has nothing to do with gender. It's the fact that she's a demigod and a superhero. Um, I have put the link to that scene in this video. So if you look down at the description of this video, you'll see a link to watch this clip. Um, but if I, I can't put it in my video because then YouTube would flag me for copyrights, blah, blah, blah. So if you want to watch that video, click in the link um, right underneath in the description box, okay? If you want to watch that scene. It's still pretty fun to watch. Um, here's the craziest thing. Three, four years of fighting, all that time you had men dying by the hundreds of thousands which accumulated almost to 50 million by the end of the war. And what did you take? Nothing. You know, you might take two miles today, but then tomorrow you lose three miles and have to retreat. So historians have gone back and studied. They looked at all of the land that was taken and all of the land that was lost, and they averaged it out. By the end of World War I, do you know how much land had actually traded hands? About a mile or so. 
Think about what Hitler did in World War II. Hitler took over the entire country of Poland, which is kind of like right here, in a month. Hitler conquered more land in one month in, in the first month of World War II than had been conquered during the entire time of World War I. Because most people just stayed in the trenches. If you got up, you get shot. And so it, it was crazy. You had men dying, getting sick, getting trench foot, getting gangrene on their foots, having to have their feet amputated because they had gangrene. Men getting sick just so that you could take one mile of land. How insane is that? Um, it wasn't all terrible. They did have some amusement sometime. Um, they would, you know, play the... Someone would smuggle in a piano. I don't know, go figure, right? Um, however, it was also very terrible. And this is the first time where, where men would come back from war with no physical injury, but they would have mental injuries. The term at the time, in the early 1900s, was shell shock. Today, we use the term PTSD, post-traumatic stress uh, disorder. When a, when a person comes back from war, they're not physically wounded, but they're mentally wounded. They've watched their best friends die. They've seen hand grenades blow their best friend up. You know, there's a piece of his arm here and a piece of his leg there. And these images of horror and death, and these men come back from war and they are so upset. This is why America is going to turn to drinking, okay? You wondered why we had prohibition in the 1920s? Why, why did we have such a huge alcohol problem? So much so that Congress had to pass a law to make people stop drinking alcohol. The reason was because of World War I. People came back from World War I and they just couldn't handle it. And so they turned to alcohol. So you had a lot of World War I veterans who just became drunks and alcoholics to deal with the pain from the war. It was so severe that literally Congress had to pass a law in the 1920s to make drinking alcohol illegal just to, you know, try to help get a control on things. Um, and you can see here's the soldier beds um, and whatnot of them coming back from war. Um, technology in the war. Um, we had new technologies that really hadn't been used before. We had seen them a little bit in the Civil War, but not, not quite as modern and as advanced as we see them now. Um, basically, we are setting the foundation of modern warfare. You're going to see U-boats or submarines. The Germans are going to perfect them, torpedoes, stuff like that. Uh, machine guns, which had been invented during um, the Civil War, like the Gatling gun, stuff like that but obviously had been perfected. The Tommy gun, machine guns, kind of like what you see in the old gangster movies. Those get invented now. Hand grenades, early versions of the tank, and um, the British will have the best versions of those. Airplanes are going to be used, although the airplanes are not going to be used so much for fighting. Um, a little bit of fighting here and there. Again, remember, airplanes are still a new technology, only a decade or so. Most of, most of airplanes are going to be used for recon, just you know, looking to see where the enemy is and then reporting that to the general so they can make their battle plans. There was more fighting done on horseback than there was on airplanes and tanks, so just saying. And of course, chemical warfare, like I said, tear gas, among others. So what was America doing at this time? Uh, nothing. America was an isolationist nation, okay? America has always been an isolationist nation. It really hasn't been until after World War II when America kind of became the policeman of the world. But for almost 200 years, America was not, okay? America didn't really care what happened in the rest of the world. We had two oceans that separated us from the rest of the world. All we cared about was what happened in our own backyard, um, North America and South America. Beyond that, we could care less what happened. Um, and so Americans, they didn't want to go to war. Remember, and this, it seems hard now to believe because it's been 150 years, 160 years for us, so it's a really long time ago. But at this time, the Civil War veterans, they were still around, okay? They were only in their 60s, 70 years old. If they were teenagers or in their early 20s, it's only been 50 years. They're 60, 70 years old. They're grandparents now, okay? These grandparents who had fought in the Civil War when America lost 500,000 men who had, you know, bloody wars like, you know, what happened across the South and the North, all right? Just 
terrible things like Gettysburg and um, just oh, where you know seventy thousand people died in three days. Okay, just terrible fighting like that. They. These grandparents who had been through that war, who had seen those experiences, they had no desire to send their grandkids to war. It wouldn't be very, it would be kind of similar to like a, a Civil War or a, a Vietnam War veteran today or a World War II veteran today, um, having no desire to go back to war after seeing the atrocities of their generation. Um, Woodrow Wilson is going to win re election in 1916 um, on the promise that he would not go to war with Europe. He was going to keep America out of the war. He was going to keep America neutral, have neutrality. His campaign slogan was, keep us out of the war. All right. So he literally won re-election by being a peace president. Well, 1916, he wins re-election. 1917, he's signing the declaration of war. So it, America goes in one year, we go from no war, no war to kill the Germans, kill the Germans. So what changed? Um, a couple of things. Four points, okay? Let's talk about them. Number one, something that had already happened. You paid attention. I hope so. <laughs> um, the sinking of the Lusitania. This was a British ship, okay? But there were Americans on it. Um, it was a, uh, um, an, a British liner, a civilian ship. It was, had n there was nothing military about it other than what I'm about to talk about. A German submarine, a U-boat, sunk this ship. It killed about 1,200 civilians and sailors, okay? Um, about 120 of those were Americans. So you can imagine when America found out that the German military had killed British and American civilians, why? Because they're evil, they're monsters, they're there, those evil, evil Germans. Well, why did they do that? Okay, this was the reason. <laughs> um, America was secretly supplying, even though we were neutral, our government was still helping out the British and the French. They were our allies, right? Um, we were sending them bullets and guns and other military equipment, but we weren't sending them with our military ships. We sent them um, weapons very secretively, like incognito. We sent them these weapons on civilian ships, okay? American military would hide them in the cargo holds, the very bottom of these ships, where like the luggage is stored, they would store the ammo, like the Lusitania, because the Americans and the British figured even if the Germans found out about it, the Germans would not would not think to attack American or American or British civilian ships, um, even if they had weapons on them or not. They they wouldn't. Germany was evil, but they weren't so evil that they would attack American ships or British ships, uh, even if they had military equipment on. You wouldn't kill men, women, and children for no reason. Well, they were wrong. Germany found out, and Germany attacked and destroyed the Lusitania and sunk the ship. Now, this is important because we didn't know about this. The meaning, we, meaning the American civilian population, did not know about this until after the war. Before the war and during the war, Americans were told by the government that the Germans just murdered civilians for no reason because other than they're evil savages and we need to stop them. Okay, so that's pretty crazy. Um, so yeah, America was giving them weapons, but nobody knew that except um, the Germans found out about it and they attacked anyways. And then after the war, it made sense. So reason number two, this one is pretty insane. Um, it's called the Zimmerman Telegraph, and basically what happened is Germany knew America was going to get, was getting ready to enter the war, and they wanted to delay that. And so the, Germany had one of their ambassadors named Zimmerman. He telegraphed, you know, the old Morse code kind of thing, right? Um, the Mexican government, and basically he asked the Mexican government if they would start a war with America. And now a Germany knew that there is no way on earth that Mexico could beat America in a war. America knew there was no way that Mexico could beat them in a war. Mexico knew there was no way they could beat America in the war. And Germany basically said, hey, you know what? You need to take back New Mexico, Arizona, and Texas from the Mexicans. 
or I'm sorry, Mexico needs to take them back from America. Those that territory belongs to the Mexicans, right? America took it from them. Well, we America defeated the Mexicans in the American Mexican War in the 1840s, and that's why we have the states we have today, right? California, New Mexico, Nevada, Arizona, etc. Anyways, the and um, Germany offered uh, millions of dollars worth of bribes. While the president of Mexico, he at least entertained the idea. He asked his advisors if it were possible, and they said emphatically, no, it's not, don't try. Um, also, the Germans were very, the Germans made a lot of money promises, but very seldomly did the Germans ever actually pay. They offered you millions of dollars for bribes, but they hardly ever paid you for it. So, um, when, the Amer when Americans found out about this in January of 1917, they were ticked off. I mean, imagine somebody paying your neighbor to attack you. You would not be very pleased about this. And here's a photo of the original telegraph that was sent. So pretty crazy. Um, the third reason is a small reason, but it's an important reason. Um, as we've talked about already, Russia was out of the war in 1917 because the Bolsheviks, Lenin and the communists, they took over the whole country. They arrested Nicholas and his family. They were under house arrest. As we've talked about already, they would all be murdered within a year. And basically, you saw this huge, powerful country of Russia brought to its knees by the communists. And mo many Americans were afraid that something that, you know, what if Germany became communist? What if France became communist? What if England became communist? Um, communists were taking advantage of the terror and the war and all the chaos created by World War I to take over these big countries. What if the communists try to take over America? Actually, they did try, but it failed, but that's a story for another day. Um, and the Nazis did too, actually, but again, story for another day. Um, and so that was one of the other big reasons why America is going to enter the war. Um, with Russia failing, they didn't want the allies, England and France, to get uh, you know their butts kicked. So America was going to come to the rescue. And the fourth and final reason is propaganda. We talked about a lot about this with World War II, um, but propaganda really got started in an industrial level in World War I. Um, every, all the propaganda you've seen from World War II, that was all built off the shoulders of World War I. Okay? Propaganda, again, is using media, art, TV, um, advertisements, to create a misleading view about your enemy. Basically, we talked about this during World War II. Demonize your enemy. Make him look like a monster or make him look like a fool. Most um, media today, you see this a lot with the media today. You have the news organizations that want to create uh, propaganda about how much they hate Trump. And so they, they put out a story, right, um, that says something bad about Trump. Or if it was Obama, they would put out a story saying, oh, we don't like Obama, or we love Obama, or we hate Trump, or we love Trump. So nothing, there's nothing new about this. This has been going on for, you know, decades. The main point of propaganda, again, is just to use emotion um, and show an image and to create emotion, okay? Um, the most famous one of all, Uncle Sam, I Want You, that got created in World War I. So that famous poster was from World War I. Um, here we see uh, America, Statue of Liberty, Lady Liberty. She's sleeping and, and, you know, the rest of the world is fighting. America won't enter the war. And so it says, wake up, wake up. Everyone needs to fight. Um, here you have um, a German pulling some female. You know, there's fire behind them. He's pulling her off to do, you know, bad things. And here you, you just have this image. You have no idea of you know what's going on it's very vague you can't see their faces it's all silhouette it's just meant to create anger and fear in you and it's meant to make you mad like oh those evil germans they're doing bad things to women okay here's another one it's russian propaganda you can see um here is the uh the czar he's getting ready to attack the the germans he looks all brave riding his horse and here's the kaiser his cousin remember and he is his his uh Kaiser Wilhelm looks like a complete fool um, getting attacked by, you know, the majestic charging czar, his cousin, Nicholas. And here you see, you know, we can win together. You have the Marines, the army, 
uh, guy, and then you have the Navy guy over here, and then you have the U.S. worker right here. The, the uh, he's not a military guy, but he's he he works in the factories, right? He makes the bullets and the guns that these guys will go use. So the idea of working together to fight the enemy. Um, I just a little disclaimer here, real quick. This is my favorite general of all time, with one exception, George Washington. Um, I love John J. Pershing. I have a photo of me standing next to his tomb in Arlington. I, Full disclosure, I have a total history teacher man crush on this guy. I could talk about him for the next three hours. He is my favorite general of all time, again, with one exception, George Washington. Um, he is the general of generals, okay? He is the only living six-star general in American history. During World War I, he led all Allied forces, okay? Normally for America, military... You are four stars. That's it. Four stars is as high as it goes. During wartime, like World War II, you can have one or two guys promoted to five stars. And that's it. No one has ever been promoted above a five-star general. Above the only, the only thing above the five-star general is the president of the United States. But one time in history, one time, one man was promoted to six stars. And that was John J. Pershing, Black Jack Pershing, okay? You might be familiar with some of the um, people under him, okay? He is not just a general of generals. He is a teacher of generals. Some of the generals that learned under his feet, people who, uh, some of his, you know, military students, if you will, um, Dwight D. Eisenhower, maybe you've heard of him, <laughs> um, General Patton, John, uh, Pat, you know, General MacArthur, um, Bradley, Marshall, all of the famous World War II generals, they all learned from him how to fight a battle, how to win, how to strategize, how to be freaking awesome and fight your enemy. They all learned from him. Um, the only general in American history who is technically above him, who's under the president, but above him, was George Washington. George Washington was a six-star general too, but George Washington wasn't quote-unquote promoted. I'm doing it right now my fingers in quotes. Um, until uh, 200 years later, okay? In 1976, Congress like promoted George Washington to a six-star general. Um, kind of, you know, it's been 200 years. Uh, who cares, right? Um, so Pershing was the only one who was promoted while he was alive. He is an awesome general. He also has a very sad story. Um, not to go off too much on this side tangent, but while he was off fighting in the Philippines, um, his family was in California. Um, his wife and his children, the house caught on fire, and his wife and all of his children died except for one. One child made it out. One of his sons made it out. So he got the telegraph that basically your family died in a fire. He's fighting a war in the Philippines. He couldn't even leave. It was like three or four months before he was finally able to leave the battlefield and go back home and see his son who was living with some family members at that time. And he got his son back. Um, so just a very hard, terrible life he had. A lot of tragedy happened to him. And in spite of all of that, he was still able to lead men into battle and to win World War I for America and the Allies. It's pretty amazing. So all military forces in World War I answered to him. It wasn't divided like how it was in World War II between MacArthur and Eisenhower. It was all through him. That's how much power um, and trust that presidents had in him. Teddy Roosevelt promoted him to general, by the way, and Woodrow Wilson trusted him that much. Um, America enters the war. We bring our tanks and our guns and our supplies. And basically, once America entered the war, that was it. Within one year, American forces had pretty much showed up. We did kind of like a sort of like a D-Day thing, but instead of crossing the English Channel, we basically just, um, France had not been conquered, so we showed up at the French trenches like, you French, why aren't you attacking? Because if we go and attack them, we get our heads blown off. Well... So guess what, Mr. French people, soldiers? America brought tanks. So again, you know, they're not the World War II battle tanks that you see panzers. I mean, they're basically just, you know, glorified trucks. with <laughs> More like snowmobiles, right? Just super-sized snowmobiles. Um, but anyways, 
um, America brought some military hardware, and within the year, the Germans had surrendered. Okay, By November 1918, Germany surrenders. Kaiser, he's going to flee for his life. He's going to run to Holland. Um, and then uh, one year after that, at um, in Paris, they're going to sign the Treaty of Versailles. Okay, Versailles is a castle. I'll show you. It's a beautiful, huge castle, too, built by the Napoleon's family and stuff. Um, Woodrow Wilson is going to try to create the League of Nations after the war. It's kind of like the precursor to the UN. The, with, its purpose was to basically unite all the countries of the world um, to prevent another war. Well, yeah, that didn't happen. Um, America didn't want to join. America didn't want to get tangled up in alliances. Like World War I started because of, of country alliances all twisted and webbed together. America was afraid that could happen again. So America did not, Americans did not want to join. And then Woodrow Wilson's going to have a massive heart attack in 1920. And so that pretty much just killed the League of Nations. So the most powerful country in the world refused to join. And then the most powerful country in the world, their leader, who wanted the League of Nations to happen, he died from a heart attack um, in 19, by 1920. And so the whole thing fell apart. But obviously uh, the UN would succeed after World War II in that area. So people come home, there's a great celebration. Um, however, this again, you don't have to write this part, this is just for your information. Um, Russia is going to suffer the most military death, again, just like in World War II. Germany second, um, French. Uh, America is only going to lose about 50,000 people. Um, obviously, we were only in the war for one year. We're, we're going to, out of 4 million or so soldiers, we only lose about 50,000. Um, all the stats, they look like this. Again, you don't, you do not need to write this down. But um, in total, military deaths, if you take all the major countries, about 6 million people died. Um, out of all the military, the ones who were wounded, about 17 million people died, about 3 million civilians. So I figure uh, military-wise, so that's about 23 million people were either killed or wounded in World War One, okay? 23 million out of 47 million. So that's about half. So in World War One, about half the people were either killed or wounded out of all the soldiers who were involved, okay? Like I said, the Treaty of Versailles happens. This is gonna set us up for World War Two. you may remember. Um, Austria-Hungary was broken up into smaller countries. So not only did they not get Bosnia, they also lost their entire empire. <laughs> Germany was deindustrialized. Basically, all the factories were shut off, which we talked about with Hitler. And basically, they had to go back to like what it was in the 1800s before the whole country um, had you know, become modern. They had to pay a huge war debt in the billions of dollars. And Germany could not keep its large military. Um, again, all of these are going to play a factor in what Hitler is going to use to take power in World War II. So you can see how World War I set the stage for Germany in World War II. Okay? And World War I happened because of the Archduke Ferdinand's assassination. So if Archduke had not been murdered, World War I would not have happened. If World War I had not have happened, none of these things on here would have happened. Hitler never would have come to power. World War II never would have happened. So this is Europe be uh, before the war in 1914. This is what it looked like after the war. So you can see the changes, okay? Um, and here you can just see them side by side. Germany's broken up. Austria-Hungary's broken up. Um, Poland comes out, Czechoslovakia, which would eventually get one day broken up into Czech and Slovakia. Um, and so you can just see the huge changes and how this is all going to set the stage for World War um, II, for sure. Now, I would be remiss if I did not talk about this. This is probably one of the most important things. If you remember nothing else from uh, this lecture, you will remember this, I bet. Especially right now in our current situation in 2020. Um, you probably have heard a lot of people talk about the Spanish flu, comparing coronavirus to the Spanish flu. So let's go through a couple of things real quick. Tell me if any of this sounds remotely familiar to you guys. Okay? Um, 
Spanish flu basically um, ha- spreads around the world, mostly because of World War I. You're going to have all these soldiers who are fighting these battles in Europe who are going to go home and who are going to get sick and take that sickness with them. You're going to have people who are living in you know very poor conditions because of the war. Their houses get destroyed. Their farms are destroyed. Their health is poor. Um, a lot of Europeans are going to get sick. Asian. So this huge war disrupts the whole world. And then there's a huge virus called the Spanish flu, okay? This influenza pandemic is going to kill anywhere between 40 to 50 million people, okay? The Black Death, the bubonic plague, only killed 30 million people. Now, 50 million people over just one year, okay? The bubonic plague took like a century to kill 30 million people. I'm just saying. Um, again, the soldiers would be in those trenches. They would be very close to each other. They'd breathe on each other. One person gets sick within a few days. They're all sick, right? Um, they would spread, okay? There was no social distancing. There was no social distancing in warfare. And so when these guys come home, they're going to get everyone in their town sick. And before you know it, the whole country and the whole world is sick, all right? About 28% of all Americans, they estimate, actually got infected from the influenza, and uh, about 670,000 Americans died. Of those 670,000 Americans, only about 43,000 of them were soldiers. I thought, but I know a lot of people have, uh, have died from coronavirus, but it still doesn't even come close to how many people died from Spanish flu. It's, it's pretty crazy. However, here were some of the things that happened um, during that time. So tell me if any of this looks familiar to you, okay? Oh, yes, I forgot about this part. Um, kids made up a jump rope song. Um, remember Ring Around the Rosies, Pocket Full of Posies, the bubonic plague song the kids created? Well, kids had an influenza song, <laughs> and this is the song they would sing while they were jump roping, right? I had a little bird. Its name was Enza. I opened the window and influenza... <laughs> Um, so how does this sign look? Do you think that this is something you could see today? Spanish influenza has endangered the pr- um, prosecution of the war in Europe. There are 1,500 cases in the Navy Yard. 30 have already died. Spitting spreads the f- Spanish influenza. Don't spit. Um, people wearing masks. Massive groups of sick people. Okay, Look familiar maybe a little bit? How about this one? Coughing and sneezing spreads a disease. It's as dangerous as poison gas. Um, so basically, you know, wear a, wear a face mask. It's coughing and sneezing is bad. <laughs> Sounds, or how about this one? All shows, meaning movie theaters or uh, 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 stage theaters too. Churches are closed, okay? Schools are closed. Any of this sound familiar, familiar to you guys? Um, you had whole counties and states closing schools, closing churches, closing public meeting places. Any of that sound any familiar to you guys? It is amazing how much history repeats itself, right? And here you see um, huge hosp- the hospitals were so overflowed that they basically created uh, tents. And people would go outside in tents, and they would have, basically, there are sick patients in each of these tents um, because the fresh air and the sun um, helped to create the Spanish influenza. What made the Spanish flu also so terrible is that normally influenza, the, the flu, would, it, you know, it kills a lot of uh, old people and it kills a lot of young people kids, babies. Um, But if you're normal, you know, if you're a healthy, normal aged adult, you know, you would get sick, but you wouldn't die from it. But in this case, you had normal, healthy people getting sick from the Spanish flu and dying. That's part of what made it so deadly. It was very indiscriminate. It didn't matter if you were young or old, it would kill you even if you were sick or healthy or if you were in the prime of life. And the very final thing I want to show you is there's some footage. You do not have to watch this. It's entirely optional. Um, But it's it's footage from 1917. The person who's narrating, he's actually narrating. It's 1950. The narrator's talking. So a narrator in 1950 is 
doing commentary on video footage from 1917. And he, he actually kind of makes fun of them a little bit, um, how naive America was. Remember, this guy in 1950, he has seen World War I, World War II. He has seen all the death and destruction of war, nuclear war. And he, he wants... He just looks back at the footage from, you know, 40 years before, 30, 40 years before this, and he's kind of just laughing at how all, how naive and innocent America was back then to think that war was an adventure and not a deadly, terrible thing. So if you want to watch that, you can. Um, the link for that video is also in the description below, okay? So uh, it's about two, three minutes long, all right? Have a wonderful day, you guys.